please, we would like to extend a thank you to the Navy detail this morning. But again, both honoring a fallen comrade. Pastor Karen Nelson and Reverend Jim Elliott mm -hmm. will be conducting the services this morning to take tribute again to Jim Colbert. Jesus said, Come to me, all that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. All are welcome here, and we are glad that you've been able to join together for this important moment. We're also very grateful for your willingness to be flexible and to mask and to socially distance. Your cooperative spirit makes moments like this possible in these times. So we gather today in this unusual way, in this unusual moment, to honor Bill's exceptional life and exceptional legacy. We grieve the hole that he leaves in your lives and in the lives of so many others who couldn't be here today, in the lives of so very many in our community. And we gather in deep gratitude for the many, many long, deeply good years that you shared together, with each of you sharing a different aspect of his life. Finally, then, we gather to comfort and encourage each other in the hope that there is more to life than this life, that there is more to life than what we can see, so that in the power of God's love, this moment is not the end for Bill. And so let us pray. God of mystery, God of hope, God of comfort, we thank you deeply for Bill. We're grateful for the amazing gift Bill was to so very many and all that he gave of himself for his nation, his community, his friends, and his family. We're grateful for his many years of excellent health and the quality of life he maintained for so long. We're grateful for all the moments and experiences you were able to share together that are now precious memories you can carry for a lifetime. In this season of change, of uncertainty, and of loss, when even our traditions for grieving together have been disrupted and become so difficult. We ask that you would be powerfully present here with each person gathered in this moment. And we ask that you would be with all of those who are grieving but could not make the trip to be here today and are instead with us only in spirit. We ask that during this time together, you would whisper into all the corners of our hearts that are hurting or frightened or angry, that we would come to know your healing and wisdom and peace. Amen.
since naming Jim is of course Jim and without measure. And that for so long I thought that I had not had the honor of meeting him until it turns out that he was Olga Lake's dashing gentleman friend and was actually here many, many times, but I only knew him as Olga's friend Jim. Um, a couple readings from scripture from Micah um, in honor of Jim's upright character. He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? And similarly from the book of James. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. From the Gospel of John, in my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go and prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. And then while I did not have the honor of knowing Jim, the Reverend Elliot did very deeply and over a great long period of time. He's going to come forward to share the eulogy and a few remarks. has worked extremely hard in preparing a eulogy for his father. You'll find in this eulogy uh, really a story of life, a story of challenge, and a story that we are all connected as a part of humanity. It begins as such. Good morning. Wait a minute. What's wrong with this? You gotta be right on top of it. Right on top of yeah, it? Yeah. Okay, I'm on top of it now. <laughs> just so the pages don't fly away. Good morning, everyone, and thank you all for taking the time to be here on this beautiful Saturday to reluctantly say goodbye to Jim Goldborg, a day many of us thought would never come. He seemed like Superman for so long, defying the odds, but time catches up with all of us eventually. He really, truly did have an incredible, long, meaningful, and historic life. And many of us here would be at peace to know we would even get close to living such a complete and full life when we know so many who did not. Of course, we are sad to lose him, but in the grand scheme of things, we were all blessed and privileged to have him for so very long. We all feel the pain of loss when losing our grandparents, usually when we are young. Many of us have lost our parents at a much older age, and Jim lived his life so well that his great-grandchildren got to enjoy him for over a decade. I hope his influence will be instilled into them, so even though he is gone, they will take a piece of him everywhere they go for the rest of their lives not knowing the turnout for today in this historic COVID world we now live, and the lengths we went to keep you all safe and comfortable in this new format. Our hope is that all of you that made it here today and the thoughts of those who didn't will take a piece of my dad's goodness with you 
through yours as well. I really think what stings the most, however, more than losing a dad, is losing a piece of our history that all of us have been given. The opportunities that we have all been given and the extraordinary lives we have lived as a direct result of the sacrifices of this great generation like my dad. And there aren't many left. We owe them everything. As sad as this day is, he lived an amazing life and that, and that is what we'll celebrate today. But where do I start? He lived such a full life. I love to tell you all I learned from him, but I will ex ex expedite his past so that one will be napping, will not be napping, I hope. <laughs> Keeping in mind there is a little bit of my dad in everyone, whether you are here or not. Born in May of 1925, the Roaring 20s, much like our past decade, many kids were born in such an enjoyable time. By the time my dad was old enough to remember the past, the carpet was pulled out from everyone as the Great Depression ensued and many families struggled mightily. This may, uh, this may have made the man he was. Still, he was an excellent student in his amazing, still similar, small hometown of Renova, Pennsylvania. Fast forward, he was among other things a rather tall student perfect for high school basketball. He wasn't even done high school before the second major event occurred, the great World War II. True to his being, he enlisted on St. Patrick's Day, 5th. But once again, cursed with being six foot two on your school team and being aboard a submerged vis vessel with no headroom, do not mix. On a sub, you must be much shorter. So against his parents' wishes, on to the Navy he went. So many thrilling stories I'm sure you've heard, but there were way too many to include today. His campaign began on the beaches of Normandy and finished off the coast of Japan in, a, in an armada twice the size of D-Day when two atomic bombs were dropped and the Empire of the Rising Sun suffered their first loss at the cost of so many innocent lives. As my dad said many times, Truman saved my life when they dropped those bombs. After honorably serving his time, he took advantage of the GI Bill and put it to good use, attending Mount Alto and Penn State University with a young Joe Paterno, where he majored in forestry and horticulture while meeting his future wife, Jane. They were married at Valley Forest Chapel in June of 1950, a month after they both graduated. I cannot believe it's been over 70 years since. Many don't even live that long. We lost Jane 22 years ago on July 4th. They moved to Habtown, where my mom grew up, and he sent a great letter to the owner of Lewis Tree Surgeons, selling himself well, and shortly thereafter, began a, li a lifelong passion of tree and landscape work. He left Lewis a month before Hurricane Hazel, which certainly helped business. Talk about timing. He bought a house, the seventh one built in Lawrence Park, had a family, ran a company, sold the uh, Lawrence Park house, had a house built where we live today in Newtown Square. I, like many of you here today, have some great memories I hope you will share with me later. I remember many of my June birthdays and those end of the school year parties. Many Christmases, hanging lights, cutting down the deck and decorating the tree. When I was too young for tools, my dad would struggle to assemble bicycles, toys, and racetracks that we would find on Christmas morning. I'm trying to expedite this, but I do have one story to share. I think it was our last holiday in Lawrence Park before we moved. 
I came down the stairs to find the greatest, coolest present ever. A Jungle Gym play set tower right next to the Christmas tree in our own living room. Wow, I didn't even need to go outside in the cold or snow to play. Best gift, gift ever. What a great day. I don't think me or my sister Sherry feet ever touched the ground that day. Jim and Jane must have heard the noise and the house was probably rumbling. It was so much fun, but as kids you know absolutely nothing, and I didn't find out for many, many years. The reason it was there, it seems my ne dad neglected one thing. He struggled through the night, building the tower in the warmth of his living room instead of the cold wind outside on Hastings Boulevard. Problem was it was way too big to fit back through the front door. And there was not enough time to disassemble before daybreak. That sure answered a lot of my young naive questions. Good thing he didn't work for NASA. <laughs> For his shortcomings with tools, he more than made up for with faithfully serving his community, giving food to the needy, donating uh, gazillions of hours to the service clubs, bowling league, park and recreation association, Gun Dacker Foundation, Marple's first hometown hero, Marple Tree Commission, Grand Marshal 2015 of the July 4th Parade, Masons there are many others but especially the Rotary, Rotary International. Cleaning out his place, I found many, many pictures of historic articles in newspapers going back well into the 50s. He was the perfect Rotarian, service above all. He served for 68 straight years with perfect attendance, ending in the month of June 2019 with what's believed to be the world's longest. That is just simply amazing. For me, working in this same field and keeping the tradition, arbitrary rings deeply to many of us. My dad was a quiet, humble guy. It strikes me after all these years, he picked on the occupation that attracts nearly the opposite type of individuals. I have vivid memories of personalities such as Clem, Dewey, Chuck, Archie, Willie Jr., and the like. The cast of characters kept the business running with their hard, diligent work but they worked even harder at not getting caught at the local watering hole. A couple places like the Old State and Jack's Tavern, both still operating in media. They didn't bother to hide. With a shop just down the street, they were barely a stone's throw from getting caught. One day they were celebrating someone's birthday and my dad walked in. The bar was so dark and cold when you got inside, you thought you left summer and the planet behind. When he walked in, you could see nothing but his silhouette of that flash bulb of light called Midday Sun behind him. Before my dad could explode, the place went dead quiet. When the foreman told him, we were celebrating the birthday. He told my dad to order a drink and he would pay for it. Everyone there was scrappy at best, full of sawdust, wood chips, smell, tobacco, and fossil fuels. My dad was the only straight-laced person in the place. How could he do this and ruin his reputation? My dad walked up to the bar and asked my respect for him began to kind of evaporate. How could my dad do this? It's lunchtime. There's a lot more work to do today. As he was about to order, I could hardly watch in disappointment when he ordered in such a quiet voice. In this bar that suddenly felt more like a library since he walked in, as he said, I'll have, I'll have a tall glass of milk. We all thought it was a joke until he backed up with no ice. I think everybody nearly hit the floor as the noisy atmosphere and my respect for my dad was instantly returned. My dad wasn't trying to be funny. That was my dad. We would on most days run a bit late in the mornings, thanks to me, but we were ironically never late for quitting time. Leaving the job by four o'clock with a semi-sober crew, driving a ragtag colorful bunch of Battlestar Galactica Mad Max trucks to get back to the shop by 4.30, because Jane would have dinner ready at 5 o'clock. 
They were the days, and frustrating as it could be, my dad loved running arbitrary. The last week has been hard. We've kept ourselves busy to keep our minds off our great loss. We cannot believe he's gone, but with this COVID thing, we got to spend even <coughs> more time with him. We keep thinking he's going to open his door leading into the house and ask what day it was and if we were okay, like he did a hundred times a day. We'd ask him how he was doing and he would giggle a bit and said, shall we say? Then in a clear throat, not bad for an old man. We're going to miss his reminiscing at the dinner table, the stories on how to make stuffing for the holiday turkey, telling us his war stories, making his cup of tea and cookies for dessert. Before going to bed, we would make sure he was okay, saying good night, we'll see you tomorrow. But he ran out of tomorrow. There was a tree dedicated to my dad at the Memorial Park on Lawrence Road a few years ago. And one of the Rotarians said he wasn't sure how long the tree would last, but my dad would outlive them all. But time catches up with all of us eventually. We got him out of rehab, honoring his wishes to pass to the other side at home with family. As he worked harder and harder to take his final breaths, his hands warmed as his last morning brightened. I turned off the night light and opened the curtains as the light poured in. The kiss of the sun, a pardon. I could hear the wife, wildlife outside, the song of the birds for myrrh. Jim loved nature. One is near God's heart in a garden, and my dad certainly saw the world more there than any place else. How appropriate, just like the poem on the mass card. I spoke to him for hours, while music from his and my mom's great years played next to his good ear on my telephone for his comfort. Though he couldn't respond, I knew he understood as several times he shed a tear as my heart poured out to him. When he took that final breath, he very quickly looked comfortable, finally at endless, painless peace. Our daughter took a short walk on the other side a few years ago. When I thought of her experience there, I felt instantly better for him, almost envious. But I want to suffer on this side a little bit longer. From what Amanda, Grandpop's buddy, said, it's a pretty amazing place waiting for us all. I may not have known where to start, but I know where to end. My dad had a love for all living things, especially those in nature, like this huge, beautiful atlas cedar to the right. So his occupation was perfect for him. I now have the reins of Arbor Tree and will try to do his legacy proud. As you look around to your left and to your right, we are all very similar, knowing the man we celebrate and say goodbye to today. We are alike in the interest, respect, and dignity we share in a man called Jim. When he or nearly anyone from his generation said something, it didn't need to be bonded, notarized, or contracted. His handshake was as good as gold. If he told you something, it would be done. My dad's legacy can live on if we remind ourselves to do the right things. Take time to help one another out or improve the lives of others less fortunate. Keep community strong and motivate our youth. If there were more people like my dad in Harrisburg or Washington, we wouldn't be trying to make America great again. We still would be. We need more people like him in this crazy COVID and changing historic world. Like my dad, this is one of the most unique ceremonies I have ever attended. Not perfect, but none of us are, and somehow it's even better. If we try a little harder, we can keep a piece of him alive. Instead of looking to your left or looking to your right, try looking deep inside yourself. I hope you managed to stay awake, and if you did, please challenge one another. Raise that bar. Be the best human being that you can be. And bring that out in others around you. We will all be much better off in the legacy of a humble, courageous, dignified, and selfless man named Jim Bulbor will live on. Just a few reflections. I met Jim some years ago when I started attending the Marple Tree Commission. 
And in doing so, he and I sometimes would be the last to leave. And we seemed to hit it off. He was uh, such a genuine human being. And we both had interesting experiences. I grew up in West Virginia where there were trees around me all the time. Uh, he was into trees. Uh, he taught me a lot. We shared a lot. Uh, one of the great stories I think you need to hear. Uh, out at Winterthur, Winterthur, it was a sycamore tree. And when he was a young man starting his business, uh, Henry DuPont got to him and wanted to know if he could save that hickamore tree, sycamore tree. And he said, yes I can, it will take about two years. And he worked on that tree, which was about 300 years old then, and now that tree is thriving today, going on 400 years old. Uh, we went out there and uh, we introduced ourselves, uh, we were kind of carted around on one of our trips out there and they finally recognized who he was. Now they have to get it into their archives. They were able to look up uh, his invoice to Henry DuPont and they were able to uh, say yes, this was a marvelous, marvelous thing that they did. And Dwayne, when you talk about nature, when you talk about uh, what it means to be in the garden, there's a theme in our faith, in both Jewish and Christian faith. It talks about three gardens. The Garden of Eden, where all human life began. For those of the Christian tradition, it was the Garden of Gethsemane, where there was suffering and struggle and death, ultimately to come. And then in our tradition, the Garden of the Empty Tomb, where no more there's suffering, but there is hopefully a rejoining of all humankind together. Regardless of where we are, who we are, how rich we are, how poor we are, all human life is valuable. That's what your dad represented. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. You're welcome. In 1938, the Chief of the Chaplains of the United States Navy wrote a prayer. And it's been used at services at the Naval Academy ever since then, so for more than 80 years now, with great regularity. And in a moment, I'd like to share it this morning in honor of Jim's naval, distinguished naval service, which profoundly shaped him as a human being, that gave our nation an unprecedented time of security and of prosperity and inspired his family for a lifetime. I want to share the Navy chaplain's words in honor of the 18-year-old kid who volunteered to help us and grew up at Normandy and off the coast of Japan in a way that some people never grow up in a lifetime. Beyond that, I also want to share those words in honor of Jim's outstanding personal character and deep commitment to decency and respect, humility, and to service. All values that are often in short supply today. And then I want to share the Naval Chaplain's Prayer because although we don't all share the same faith, and I deeply respect that we don't all share the same faith, that I was invited to be a part of this this morning as a person of faith. And for me personally, in times of difficulty, in times of change, in times of conflict, in moments when it's too easy to be discouraged and difficult to be optimistic, in moments like this when you've endured a significant loss in your lives and you know that things will never be the same, these are the moments where it is personally helpful for me to lean on a strength beyond my own strength. And I find it can be comforting to lean into the possibility that there is more to Jim's life than what we can see, and that your life and my life and his life are all very much holy and precious beyond measure, that we're designed for love and connection and relationship, that his legacy means something, and that in the power of God's perfect love, this is not the end. Instead, he has set sail on a new and glorious adventure where no perils await him, 
and he is not too tall. And so let us pray together as you feel comfortable. The Naval Chaplain's Prayer, as so many sailors have prayed before us, and those of us who have not served can listen in with humility. Almighty Father, whose way is in the sea, and whose paths are in the great waters, whose command is over all and whose love never faileth, let me be aware of thy presence and obedience to thy will. Keep me true to my best self, guarding me against dishonesty in purpose and in deed, and helping me so to live that I can stand unashamed and unafraid before my shipmates, my loved ones, and thee. Protect those in whose love I live. Give me the will to do the work of a man and to accept my share of the responsibilities with a strong heart and a cheerful mind. Make me considerate of those entrusted to my leadership and faithful to the duties my country has entrusted to me. Let my uniform remind me daily of the traditions of the service of which I am a part. If I am inclined to doubt, steady my faith. If I may be strong to resist, if I should miss the mark, give me courage to try again. Guide me with the light of truth, and keep before me the light of him whose example and help I trust to obtain the answer to all my prayers, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And then let us hear the words of the Navy hymn.
go in peace knowing that he is at peace. This does conclude the services here today for Jim Goldberg, but certainly he will live on within each and every one of you. Please keep the family in your thoughts and prayers in the days, weeks, and months to come. Give them a call, drop them a line, Facebook, whatever social media thing you're into these days, but please keep the family in your thoughts. Uh, Glenn has asked that I invite each and every one of you to join them over at Tekka over on 252. If you should have questions to get there from here, you're welcome to see me or any of our staff and we'll be more than happy to give you directions to get there. Again, this does conclude the services and again, please keep Glenn in your thoughts and prayers. Thank you for coming to today to honor Jim, a very special man in most of our lives. Thank you. Mm -hmm.